Is the jazz scene in New York dead? Is it in decline? Or is it all just a fever dream in the imagination of this baby boomer? I mean, I was born in like 1933. Anyway, let's talk about it. I should start out with a disclaimer because the optics here are awkward. I think we YouTubers have written ourselves a big blank check to swoop in and comment on things we don't necessarily understand, and I'm not sure I like the direction of that trend line. So let me say two things up front. First, I haven't participated actively in the scene since around 2013 or 2014, when I went into my internet cave and became more of a YouTuber than an active performing musician. I did play jazz in New York from around 2001 to 2014 though, with mixed success in my career. Second, the only intellectually honest way to do this video is to use it as the start of a discussion, rather than acting like I'm the last authority. So the aim here is to raise questions, do my best to answer them, and then refer them to you, kind of. Anyway, with those disclaimers out of the way, I'm standing outside of Basic, a bar in my neighborhood that's had a jam session for ages. Back in the day, my friend Isaac used to run the session. Now, I'm not sure who runs it anymore. But anyway, I'm mentioning Basic because I was walking my dog the other night, and I heard something I haven't heard in ages. Live jazz spilling out onto the street. I used to hear it all the time in my old neighborhood on the east side of Prospect Park. There's a guy who practiced tenor sax at around the same time every day across the courtyard from me. Every day for a decade. Two stops down, my friends Aki, Chris, and Rodrigo basically created a scene from scratch around Cortelli Road in Brooklyn. There's a spot called Bar Chord, and before that a spot called Solo. Just blocks from my apartment, there was a jam session downstairs at the Bluebird, and people would perennially play at a bar just around the corner from me, where at total random I discovered my friend Michael hosting a jam session on my way to meet my wife at the subway, and had time to stop in and sit in for a there was Barbez across the park and Shapeshifter Lab down the street from that. And by the way, I think both of those are still open. All of which is to say, I was happy to discover music at Basic the other night. Because it feels like a lot of what I've described, that spontaneous popular energy, is gone. So let's talk about what got me started thinking about the whole thing. Over the past couple months, I've had a few friends visit from overseas, and all have had the same observation. When I was here in the early 2000s or 20 teens, the scene felt alive, like it was pulsating and growing. But on my latest visit, it didn't. One thing to add, for the past couple years, I've been talking about getting a 55 bar hang together. Because I got some BJJ friends who are into jazz, so I thought, why not organize a night? Then I hear the 55 bar is closing. The New York music scene just kind of got dealt a pretty heavy blow with the news that the 55 bar is closing. When I've gone to watch some performances recently, my impression has been of some very accomplished artists doing a dazzling rendition of exactly what was the next thing back in 2010. Okay, okay, so it seems like this, it feels like that, Let's be a little more precise. Say we're gonna be social scientists here and try to get some kind of data on this. So it's not all just one man's anecdotal experiences. Work with me here, but I'd say there are at least three categories of things that make a scene. First, number of venues where interesting live jazz is happening. As distinct from wedding band music. I mean high level stuff from music school students and grads on up to the vanguard, lowercase v, of the next generation of artists. That can include gigs, jam sessions, and importantly, sessions at people's apartments. Or rehearsal spaces or music school rehearsal spaces, which used to be a lot of where jazz occurred. Number two, number of active participants in the generation coming up. More on this later, but it's important because a big part of jazz's audience is younger jazz students. And finally, the music itself. Are the tip of the spear players doing stuff that feels dangerous and rebellious, but which is still informed at least at some level by the tradition? Let's take these in order, first from my perspective, and along the way maybe we'll try to get some data. Factor one, number of venues. First, my own experience. Smoke on the Upper West Side. The Iridium, Cleopatra's Needle, Fat Cat, Cornelia Street Cafe, Bar Next Door, The Manhattan Knitting Factory. Anybody remember that? Here's an even deeper cut, Tonic. Tonic used to be a thing, not anymore. The Zinc Bar. The Jazz Standard. The Jazz Standard. That spot was brand new, with a great menu, a great space, and great acoustics. And now, the 55 Bar. 
Not to mention more niche spots like Rose Live Music or the Tea Lounge or Corzo, where James Carney used to host the Conception series, where you'd hear crazy music on a Tuesday night. Or Kitano, a little cocktail bar on the second floor of a Japanese hotel near Grand Central. Gone. Is iBeam still open? The last gig on their Facebook page was in October 2021. Let me know, guys. These are all the spots I remember seeing or playing jazz between 2001 and, like, 2014. And they give a feeling of a thriving, growing scene. Now they're all gone, and I'm not sure if venues have come up to replace them. Let's see if we can find any data on this. Okay, so data was hard to find, but I did find this article from Gothamist about the closure of the 55 bar. The article mentions a growing list of NYC venues forced to shutter. Additionally, I've posted on Facebook about this, and hardly anybody has come up with new venues that are replacing the old ones closing, although there are a couple. So I'm gonna go ahead and call this one confirmed with a question mark. But wait, big exceptions to this trend. Smalls. Smalls kept their doors virtually open during the pandemic, and now by all reports, they've seized the mantle as the place to see young up-and-comers, as well as old legends. The Jazz Gallery, still open as far as I know as of the writing of this piece. The Vanguard, still open, and I saw some very good music there recently. Birdland and Dizzy's, still open. There's some good music at those spots, at times, and I'm just gonna leave that there. New Blue, where I'm told a lot of the new offshoot music is happening. Still very much open. And Rockwood Music Hall. Where people like Now vs. Now and the Adam Neely helmed Sun Gazer are said to perform. Still going strong. Plus, when I took to the airwaves, people informed me of a couple of new venues I hadn't heard of. There's a spot called Irmana, a spot called Ornithology, and apparently a new jam session at a spot called The Craftsman, just down the street from my old music school. I haven't checked any of these places out, but if you have, let me know how they are. And Basic. I love you, Basic. So it's not a totally one-sided story. Many people who stayed closer to the scene than I have told me on social media that there are green shoots, which gives me hope. Factor two, the number of active players coming up. For this, I have to go by data. A quick search of jazz studies degrees awarded by year brings up this result from a site called Data USA. According to this site, there were 532 total jazz grads in the year 2020. And at the time it was growing by about 3% a year. I like that 2020 stat because it's pre-COVID. But let's dig deeper. Oh wow, I can actually download a CSV from this site. So if I total up the number in 2020, it's 532. Let's skip to the end. I total up the numbers of degrees in a couple random years between 2000 and 2020. In 2012, the earliest year they have on record, it was 498. In 2014, it was 512. In 2017, 586. And in 2019, it was 557. So, big shrug emoji. It's really tough to find quantitative data on this stuff that's searchable in the public record, even for my alma mater. In one Jazz Times article from 2019, heads of famous jazz programs say their enrollment is still going well despite some kind of economic crisis that was supposedly happening back then. Do you guys miss the stuff we used to worry about before COVID too? Sheesh. So color this one hard to confirm, but it appears enrollment numbers aren't getting any worse at least. Oh, here's why that's important. It's really the jazz students that make up that scene. It's a bit circular, but one of the things that made the scene so great in the early 2000s and 20 teens was going to the 55 bar with fellow jazz students and watching Dave Binney or Wayne Krantz or any of the multiple Ari Honig led groups or catching Glasper for the first time in John Ellis's band at the Jazz Gallery along with Kendrick Scott and Mike Moreno. There's something else. Yeah, you can't say jazz is economically viable if it's not attracting new fans. But it also loses its way in a hurry if it's only appealing to older people with money. The young jazz school hipsters are like foodies. I'm not sure you get an El Bouilly or a Noma if it's not for a niche group of fans who make those places cool. Then they cross over to people with tech jobs who like going someplace cool. If you tried to make a restaurant directly for 30-somethings with tech jobs and money, you'd probably get something like Landmark. Or something else delicious but safe. It's the same with neighborhoods. When neighborhoods are cheap, artists move in. They make it cool, and hopefully you get some cool experimental restaurants taking advantage of the low rent before real estate investors move in and ruin the whole thing. But if you try to build a neighborhood directly for investors, you get Long Island City, or Kent Ave. Likewise, the best life cycle for jazz appears to be creating music for insiders, creating a cool scene, which then attracts people from the periphery who want to be part of something cool. The hipsters force the music to be innovative and take risks. When you try to make jazz directly for corporate clubs, it's really easy to make music that's just an impression of the music all those people remember from the records, or more likely don't remember from the records.
Which segues into my third criterion. I need a shorter word. It sounds too pretentious. Factor three. People pushing the music, taking risks. It's not just a quantity thing, it's a quality thing. There are multiple ways to play jazz, including just playing jazz standards and swinging and playing great solos. I don't want to imply that that kind of playing is in any way stale, but it's like a mixologist making classic cocktails or a chef making classic dishes. You're kind of hoping they innovated something too. And from the early 2000s to the early 20 teens, jazz had a nasty, and by nasty, I mean nice insurgent streak. People taking the music in the directions that I don't know, can you do that? It had a just slightly disrespectful energy in a very good way. Few offshoots I want to mention. Obviously Glasper, look at some early Glasper footage. People were like, what is this? VJ Iyer. Now versus now, watch this clip from somewhere in Europe. It's punk rock. They were playing stuff that you kind of weren't supposed to be able to play at a gig and you could tell they knew it and they were enjoying it. Kneebody. Everybody knows they're bad. But what I want to remind you guys is how forbidden it felt in 2009. What? You can do that? Here's a controversial one. Knower. I'd argue that belongs on that list too. Oh, interlude. Before you come at me with a long list of fusion artists who you say are also innovating in jazz, okay, I respect that. But remember, this is a video about jazz in New York. And New Yorkers are kind of particular about their jazz. To be considered valid, somebody really needs to have studied the tradition and be able to take a decent solo over stablemates. Is that gatekeeping? Yes. Did I invent it? No. But it's part of why it's a pretty narrow niche for jazz artists pushing forward and making punk rock. You have to be able to play in a traditional way and then choose to push and redefine and take risks. Before you can move jazz forward, you have to be in contact with jazz, kind of thing. Okay, with that out of the way, there's Tigran, obviously. Then a whole bunch of more subtle innovators and risk takers. People who still worked within the palette of traditional jazz, but still push things forward. Jason Moran and all the bands he inspired. Walter Smith III. Ben Wendell's solo bands, Miguel Zenon. To anyone who used to be in the scene, I call this jazz gallery jazz. And you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Anyway, it's my argument that all these people taking risks and being rewarded for it by the jazz student hipster fan base. Remember them from earlier? All these people taking risks created a context where even those playing relatively inside music still sounded like punk rock. Gerald Clayton writes beautiful melodies, but did so in a context where he was totally free to create. And all of his music sounds and feels fresh. Galad Hexelman, same thing. Pretty hummable songs that are just a little bit punk rock in their subtleties. Will Vincent, with any combination of Aaron Parks, Marcus Gilmore, Ari Honig, Matt Brewer, Walter Smith, Kendrick Scott, etc. Beautiful, hummable tunes that still took risks. Check out Will's group playing Stablemates live at Smalls. Damn. And the issue, now that it's 2022, is that most of those folks have become the mainstream. What I call Vanguard Jazz with a capital V. And again, if you know the jazz scene, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. In 
And who are the next generation coming up to take their place? They're there in quantity, according to the crappy data I was able to... I really need a research assistant. But are they pushing the music? Are they doing stuff that feels a little forbidden? By the way, there are people doing that stuff. Quick montage. But those people are kind of at the top of their scenes already. The real question is, and I'm gonna sound like an insufferable hipster here, can you still hear from your classmates that Miles Okazaki is playing with Dan Weiss, Miguel Zenon, and Thomas Morgan at the Cornelia Street Cafe, and duck in there after some drinks and have your mind totally blown? Can a friend tell you to check out Ari Honig with Sean Michelle Pilk? And nobody's even talking about them on NPR yet. They don't have any records out on major labels, but you see them at Bar Next Door. Can you drop in on Miguel Zenon at the Jazz Gallery before he's even released his first record? And here's the last part. Are all the students who are gobbling all this music up with a spoon taking it back to their schools and starting to take more risks in their own jam sessions? Writing more interesting tunes? I'm just gonna drop Ofri Nehemiah here because it strikes me as an example of talented youngsters taking risks. And that's the part that brings us all back to New York. I saw in some Instagram comments, it's not New York anymore, it's all international now. Eeeh. Look, I don't want to toot my own horn, and it's not like I've been particularly successful at it, but I was maybe one of the OGs getting online. You don't need a location anymore, man. Just follow your bliss on the internet. I was the guy saying that. Except for jazz. For jazz, you need in person. And for people to get really good and quality to percolate, you need a lot of nodes in that system. You need to be bouncing off different players of various levels a few times a week. Just playing sessions, getting reps, gathering data, etc. You're not gonna get it without being in a room with other humans, which is why in person. And you're not gonna get the fat part of the bell curve, which both provides an audience for the top players and matriculates some good players who come up from it in a small scene, which is why jazz needs New York. So let's review. Is jazz dead or dying in New York? Let's look again at our three factors. Are venues decreasing? Probably. My jazz friends see green shoots, which is good, but it's hard to argue we haven't lost more venues than we've gained. Are students decreasing? Luckily, it seems like no. Are they still checking out music and creating an early adopter dynamo that both holds jazz accountable for not resting on its laurels and also attracts concentric rings of people attracted to the cool, which lets people like Robert Glasper have a career? Not enough data. Is risk taking decreasing? I hate to say it, but it seems like yes. There are definitely green shoots if you look at places like Smalls and New Blue. And it's totally possible that I'm just missing stuff because I haven't been in touch with the scene for a few years. But I'd have to say it is. Postscript, Winter Jazz Fest. It's hard to think of anything more emblematic of the health of the New York jazz scene than WJF. When WJF first started happening, I actually reached out to the founder to interview him from my blog, and he got back to me. I can't remember why we never made it happen. But anyway, I was a huge fan. You'd see these crazy videos like CD release shows for Glasper or the Kendrick Scott Oracle, and bands like Now vs. Now. WJF recognized exactly the kind of risk taking that's both jazz but also pushing the boundaries. The knee bodies, the Tigrons, the VGIers, the Steve Lehmans, and set out to nurture it. And COVID dealt WJF a big blow. And I sincerely hope WJF will be back to full strength soon. And I can understand COVID caution. But this past winter, after we'd had access to vaccines for nine months, after people had been traveling, dining in restaurants, etc., you know what I'm gonna say. WJF went virtual. And I love you guys, but that was the wrong move. You should either have postponed or canceled, or else gone ahead with disclaimers. In my humble opinion,
Anyway, what do you think? Is Jazz in New York dead? Is it dying? Or in a low point? Or maybe I'm way off base. Set me straight in the comments. And guys, if you dug this video and you want to get more videos like it in your inbox every week, there's an easy way to do that. Just click the link below the player and enter your email address in and I'll know where to send them. And I'll also send you a free gift, my three video mini course, which will make you playing better in the next three weeks than it's gotten in the previous six months. Dudes, it's been real. Always enjoy these. See you again soon in another lesson of the week. Is she crying because the jazz scene in New York is dead? What do you think? I'm gonna get decent audio from this. I'm gonna let it ride for a second, see if they, uh, they take a pause. You're a little bit flat. Yeah. I love this channel. Oh, I'm thanks so much. Yeah. Amazing. What's your name? It's cool I'm Nice to meet you, Nate. What's your name? Nate. Nate. That's yeah, you so actually nice. you actually caught me literally in the middle of filming. Shit, I'm sorry. No worries. I didn't want to like interrupt, but just thanks for making your content. Oh, thank Super inspiring, and I'm, I'm a drummer, and, and only in the last year have I started to kind of do it professionally. And Amazing. So it's thanks to like seeing content like yours and other people's that's like wow, like. You know, so, so thank you so much for that. You got it, man. Great to meet you. Thanks for the shout out. Thanks Take so care. Much. Have a good one. I'll look forward to this video. Yeah, I know. <laughs>